Okay. So then if you're here for the first time, <laughs> don't forget to subscribe on our event boards and you will be informed when there is new events. We're usually like hosting these types of events every month. So feel free to subscribe and join us. So um, yeah, just a few words before we are starting about Exa Bootcamp. Um, we are basically an online virtual reality and augmented reality academy. We are focusing on, um, yeah, basically on training our students and our course participants with real industry projects. Um, and we are focusing on basically getting everyone ready to join the virtual reality industry. So our curricula are basically developed together with industry experts. And we also, I mean, you should have seen our invite to the XI Creators Discord server where, um, where you can join and see everyone else who's, who's uh, coming and discuss virtual reality and augmented reality. And of course, ask any type of question you have um, concerning VR and AI development. So maybe we can share um, share the Exa Creators Discord invite so that everyone can join who wants to. Would be great to to have everyone. And yeah, so basically we are the only academy out there which is focusing on offering beginner level, intermediate level, and advanced level courses. So um, depending on your level, you can check our courses and see what might may be a good fit for you. So um, basically what you can start with, if you're really a um, beginner beginner and just are interested in joining, uh, we have a free C Sharp course. So even if you don't know if virtual reality development is for you, um, you can join, learn um, the beginnings of C Sharp development and see are you actually having fun doing this type of work. Um, yeah, and see if you actually like and want to go further with VR AI development. Um, all our students, and we are very happy about that, are um, usually very happy <laughs> with us. So there is, for example, Keshav's review, and he even, um, yeah, he was super happy. He, he got to work, um, he gets to work at an aerospace company now in LA um, in virtual reality. And there's also many um, companies like also VR who are basically um, yeah, regularly sending their VR developers to Exa Bootcamp to take our courses. So um, yeah, if you're taking our courses, um, as already said, there's many, many companies which are sending their developers. So you will be in good company. And yeah, to start from the beginning, basically after doing the C Sharp free coding course, uh, you can join the Excel Foundations Bootcamp. And what you will, I mean, our, our, our um, objective for the after our bootcamp is that you actually um, become virtual reality and oriented reality development proficient. You can prototype, you know the most important uh, tools, you know the development journey, and you're capable, safe capable to develop your own ideas by yourself 100%. Um, after the foundations course, there's our prototyping course. And as a prototyping course is really to get you job ready. Um, it's, uh, we are creating together with you, we are creating a portfolio of impressive virtual reality, augmented reality projects. You are meshed in teams and together with the other students, you're also learning um, the workflow of professional virtual reality team development. And you're together, you're coming up with a portfolio of projects, um, your individual ideas, and you're developing them by yourself. But of course, if you need support and if you have development questions, our mentors are always there to support you. And yeah, these are example showcase projects from our students. And it's always very, very impressive for us to see. And we are also regularly posting new projects. Uh, we currently have a, have a VR Foundations course running. So you will soon also see new projects um, that our students are working on. And it's always super cool what kind of different type of creative ideas uh, students are having. And yeah, and how, how, how good the implementation is actually, even for, for beginner level students. And then I think that's uh, the most interesting class for our audience today is the HoloLens and Mixed Reality class. We are hosting together with the AWE Academy. And here it's all um, yeah, our trainers, Sean Ong and, and Fabian Kostor are, are teaching. And yeah, you will basically be able to create your own mixed reality experience after finalizing this course. Uh, we also have a class about rendering optimization starting soon. And yeah, just a few more words about XR Bootcamp. Um, 
So what we are always focusing on is to handpick our trainers. So basically all our trainers are um, have their own successful VR game studios, are working as, as um, game developer, virtual reality developers at AAA game studios, like for example at Ubisoft. Um, they're award-winning trainers and they're really, really passionate about teaching virtual reality development and sharing their knowledge. And um, yeah, and it's really practical. So they are always, um, because they all, all of them have their full-time jobs, they're not working full-time at Extra Bootcamp. They're just teaching with us, mentoring with us. So they really have to stay up to date with their knowledge. So um, we don't risk to teach updated knowledge. And I think that's very important in today's world, especially in the virtual reality world, because everything is changing so quickly today. And yeah, Ferhan, did you want to add something? I mean, um, for us, it's really about, yeah, for, especially for our beginner level courses that we are focused on employability. So um, we always have the one-on-one -on -one mentorship for students, also with our career supporter, career support services. So basically we are matching our students with recruiters. And um, yeah, and it's all about making you self-capable, even designers to prototype um, your own virtual reality and augmented reality. Um, ideas and um, yeah, and for us it's really important that it's actually cohort-based courses. So we're all starting together, we're all finishing together in one course, so that you also have the accountability with the other students to finish on time, to finish your assignments, and to also work harder as um, as you would if you just followed like a basically a self-paced video course. So uh, maybe one thing that I can add, uh, Rahel's point is. Um, there are, I assume that there are many designers or at least uh, people who are interested in the design side. Uh, in XR world, maybe you have, uh, if you haven't, you can also watch uh, on our YouTube channel. We have uh, organized a few unboxing XR dev careers uh, sessions. So the technical recruiters from Accenture, Tesla, also we are actually joined to this program. And all of them are actually agreeing on one thing. Even though you are a designer, if you want to have a, a, like a strong career in XR industry, you need to have at least uh, basic prototyping skills. So the word here is self-capable to prototype your own design ideas are very critical for this industry. So as Rahan mentioned, why we tell that we are the only actually academy for that because we have also advanced courses that you can um, not only start in the beginner level, intermediate level, but also advanced level that you can even come to a level of an, ex an experienced XR design focused prototyper or XR software developer. So we, we are covering all these two uh, main um, disciplines. So uh, I just want to mention that this is maybe the critical thing for, for um, getting a job in XR industry, especially in today's um, landscape. And we will go through that uh, in this session, maybe a little bit, but you can also watch the other uh, events, recordings to understand better what is actually needed as a skill, uh, if you are a designer or no coder. So we are actually getting you covered, even though you are an absolute beginner, uh, you can start with us and in five months you can come to a point that you can design develop create your own xr vr ar prototype uh, from scratch so exactly. that's that's what we are aiming for and just to answer the questions yeah it would be great if you can add the questions to the q and a tool i will just go over the ones in the chat so basically how long are the boot camps so for the boot camps um that's our beginner level classes and the master classes that's our advanced level classes and for the beginner level boot camps that's usually for each for the foundations plus the prototyping one um that's four to five months um depending on if you're doing the c sharp course uh, before that and then our advanced level courses they are usually like um really depending on which one um two months around two months but all of our courses are part-time so um you can all do it next to your job actually so um i mean we have a few and, more questions um, different than getting a master's degree a master's degree is usually in and universities, right? So we are much shorter, obviously. Um, so you can get employable in a much, much quicker amount of time. And a master's degree at university is much more theoretical, right? And it's much more going deep. And obviously, in the amount of time that we are offering, we are really focused on getting you the practical skills you need to get immediately job ready. And 
anything that we missed? We can we can take these questions, but as you mentioned, please submit your questions in the q and I'm just worried that it will be lost in the chat window. So uh, let's quickly wrap up so that we can start the uh, webinar, uh, the MR design principles part. Yeah, so just one uh, last point we wanted to mention is that, yeah, since we have these beginner to advanced level courses, our advanced level course participants are, of course, also always looking for teams and are looking to hire. So that's a great advantage. And we are also like with doing all these industry events and um, going to expos and conferences. We are, of course, always further building out our network to, to get the best and earliest uh, access of job opportunities uh, for our talent to basically match them. And um, especially for me and for, for whole Except Bootcamp, it's very important to also increase diversity and inclusion in the industry. As you can imagine, um, it's always uh, very difficult in the tech industries. So we won sometimes scholarship campaigns, uh, depending on which companies we are finding basically to support us with that. So um, yeah, you can always look out for that and subscribe to our newsletter if you want to stay informed. Um, yeah, so just like to give you an um, impression of our trainers' portfolios, um, it's it's always very impressive to see. I hope you can yeah um, watch that now, and yeah, and that's our course schedule for twenty twenty two. And happy if you want to add anything, Ferhan. Is there a question we should immediately the, answer? Should we? we can we can go back to the questions because we will have a Q and A session at the end, anyways. So okay. I want to leave the stage to actually Lauren, who is the actually the uh, main actress of today's uh, session. So maybe we can uh, we can first get some inspiration from her, and then our team, our the other trainer team of Hololens class, will also join uh, in the roundtable. So we hope to have a very nice expert roundtable afterwards. Stage is yours, Lauren. All right, hi friends. Um, here, let me pull up my slides. And do, do, do. So by the way, if you haven't uh, look at Lauren's crazy AR concepts, uh, I think uh, one of them or a few of them he, she will show today, but yeah, uh, I recommend that you follow her uh, LinkedIn page and her uh, web page. Yeah. Yeah, we're really excited yeah. to you, Lauren. Thanks so much for joining us and the exactly. stage of yours now. <laughs> Thank you. I love the XR Bootcamp. I, like, I've only seen great work from your students. So I'm um, super excited to be talking to your audience. Um, but yeah, hi, everybody. I'm Lauren. I am an artist and a creative technologist based out of Santa Fe, New Mexico. <clears throat> and I mostly work within the space of XR and emerging technology. Um, and I've had like a pretty eclectic career. I started as an intern at the MIT Game Lab. I had like a whole career in video games before I went all in on XR. Um, and I recently started a studio with my co-founder, Sam Jones. Um, and it's an XR studio. And like some of the soul searching that you do when you start a studio is like, who are you? What does your company do? How are you different? Like, what's your point of view? What are you making? Um, and I think my point of view is this pile of trash. Um, what I hope XR will do, what I see as its potential as a technology, why I want to work with it. Um, it always comes back to this pile of trash and how it made me feel. So this pile of trash is not actually a pile of trash. This is a uh, meticulously painted bronze sculpture by Gavin Turk. And I saw this and several of his other pieces in a gallery in London, and they were all on the floor, these beautiful immaculate sculptures of trash and precious metal. There was like a cigarette butt and a foam to go container. Um, and, and they were so perfectly sculpted and perfectly painted. And, um, and I was mesmerized. And when I left the gallery, um, this funny thing happened where for weeks after, I was fascinated with every piece of trash that I saw, like on the subway, on the street, when I was just walking around, every piece of trash I saw was just screaming out to me. I couldn't see anything else. And I was really, really fascinated by this shift that had happened in my perception. Um, I was seeing things in my world that were totally invisible to me before, you know, even though the visual stimulus was there, um, 
I, it, I didn't see it. It wasn't entering my brain before. And now I was seeing it everywhere. And I had this new, what felt like this um, enhanced perception of my world. And, and I was like, whoa, um, that, I want to do that. Whatever that thing was that has just happened in my brain this week, like, I want to do that on purpose. And someone told me, um, you know, like, there's sort of a word for that feeling, which is apophenia, which is like a, a crossed wires meaning making that we do as humans. So if you're seeing Jesus in your toast, you might be experiencing apophenia, or if you know you're obsessed with trash for a week. And that put some lights off in my brain. And I was like, you know, games are really good at this. Like, I think it's one of the things I really liked about being a game designer. Um, it, you know, like after playing The Witness, I was seeing puzzles everywhere. I'm sure anybody who's played The Witness had that experience. And um, I think game designers are generally very good at creating those perceptual shifts. And AR especially, and I'm going to go way more into this, um, but, but one of the things that first got me really excited about this was having that experience with Pokemon Go. Um, I started noticing parts of my neighborhood that I walked past all the time, but I was not perceiving those things. The information never entered my brain. And then playing this game, it did. And, and I had worked on a lot of projects that were already about perceptual shifts. So like Monument Valley was about working with non-Euclidean multi-stable images and constructing these worlds and puzzles that were like really fundamentally about challenging the way that you perceived that image in that world to work already. And I think that also helps me understand why I personally was not super excited about VR. Um, now, I, I worked on some VR games like Luna that I'm very proud of. It's very cool to build totally new worlds for people to inhabit. But I was sort of realizing, I don't think I want to build new worlds. I think I'm, I'm really invested in the real world. I want to make things that make people feel invested in the real world too. Now, uh, the real world is super messed up and I am not arguing that escapism doesn't have its place. Like I 100% want to go play video games and go somewhere else sometimes, especially after the past three years. Like my plan tonight is to play a lot of um, Horizon Zero Dawn Forbidden West, but like as a designer, I kept coming back to the trash and um, how much it shifted my experience of the real world. And that's how I got excited about mixed reality because it's all about this world, right? Like if it's good. Um, if my phone is this magic like little glass window into other worlds that I can like peer into and, and VR is magical glasses, that transports me entirely to other worlds, um, then MR is like the magic glasses into this world. And I think I really want those glasses. I want the world I'm in to feel really precious and meaningful and like Jesus is on all of my toast and all of the trash is made of gold. Um, and, I, and I think AR has the best chance of doing that, uh, of creating those sorts of feelings. And, uh, and thus began my journey into mixed reality. And it turns out that um, turning trash into gold in people's brains is actually really hard. Um, but I'm gonna talk about the times that I've sort of tried to make that happen, um, where I think they've succeeded, where I failed, what I learned, um, and, and what I think that you as XR designers and thinkers and creators can take away from that. And, um, you know, driving home, you know, what, what I hope we can do as creators, which is bring people that feeling to, to not try to displace their worlds with this technology, but to enhance or alter or shift their perception of this very precious singular world that we are all already in together. Um, so with that, I marched off out of video games into the world of mixed reality um, in Silicon Valley with like big ideas and like fumbled around at various places in Silicon Valley for a while. And like, that was that. And I started learning how to build things for headsets. And um, after a short while, I happily marched right back out of Silicon Valley. Uh, and I came to New Mexico to, uh, to Meow Wolf to be their XR creative director. Um, so Meow Wolf, if you haven't heard of Meow Wolf, it's a little hard to explain, but it was a, it was once this sort of art collective based in the desert, and now they create these large scale immersive exhibits. Um, and let me tell you, I was really, really excited about Meow Wolf. They have the whole perceptual shift thing really, really down. They are so good at it. 
Um, if any of you have been there and you've walked through this fridge, there's a normal kitchen with this fridge and then you open it up and, and you're in this alien world. Um, you know how good they are at shifting your perception of the architecture of sort of the basic lived reality of kitchens and, and homes. Um, and they had all these amazing connected wired up physical spaces that I was going to get to go play and learn in. Um, and, and the first thing that I had the chance to direct for them was an experience called the garage. So the garage was an immersive play that was done in magic leaps that took place at neighborhood autos. Uh, we had a warehouse in Santa Fe that we set up like a mechanic shop, but everything was not quite as it seems. And the mechanics there had some other things in store for you beyond your 3,500 mile oil change. Um, side note, this warehouse was actually next door to an actual auto shop and people would accidentally walk in our back door um, looking for their mechanic and they would see this 10 foot mech and be like, what is happening? Um, which they like, talk about perceptual shifts, but anyway, um, the experience consisted of about 10 mini XR experiences. The actors were in headsets, you were in headsets, you were interacting with each other um, and then they were connected to various pieces of machinery or artwork throughout the warehouse. Um, and there's a lot of things I learned here, but one of the first was if you were building a narrative experience that you should contextualize your hardware. Um, we renamed the magic leaps. We gave them a story. We gave them new stickers. Um, they weren't magic leaps. They were constant positioning systems or compas for short. And, um, I think there's two things that narratively placing your hardware can do. The first is it's an invitation to play. Um, a, a friend's five-year-old will often insist to me that the truck is not a truck, it is in fact a plane and we are co-pilots and the dinner table is actually a magical bus to Alaska. And if you've spent time around a kid who's always in that imagination space, like being around people who are already there, it can be very expanding. Um, you know, it's not a great leap for a kid to see treasure in a pile of trash, though it might be for adults. And by inviting, you know, just like a little pretend at the beginning of something, a little bit of playfulness, you're setting people up for the right mental space. Um, but more importantly, I think what it can also do is invite in those who might feel nervous about the technology. One of the biggest barriers that I have seen with first time users of a headset um, is this fear that they should already know how it works. Um, that if they don't, and if they ask you for help, they're gonna look not very smart. Um, I once had a guest go through an entire experience with their headset turned off because they were too scared to tell me that it was broken. And they thought just the chromatic aberration that they were seeing was what we meant when we said holograms. So I think if you're starting out and you're saying, no, 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 this is not human technology. No one expects you to understand how this works because it's never been on this planet before. Um, it can be a little easier for those people to, to join in the play with you, but also ask you for help. Um, another big learning was ambient set dressing is great. Digital set dressing is great. And when they come together, they can also be so much more. So the garage was chosen as one of the top XR, of, uh, XR experiences of 2019 by Forbes. And the reporter who gave it that distinction told me that it was because of this part of the experience, because of the trash portal. Um, so big surprise, more trash from Lauren. Um, we, had, we had this really big platform in the warehouse that we could not move. Um, so we just piled up a bunch of trash on it that we got from a dump. Um, and in the magic leap, we put a portal over it. We, we assigned an actor to it and put a sign on it. And the actor would just tell you, he'd be like, oh yeah, that's the trash portal. You don't need to worry about the trash portal. And you didn't need to worry about the trash portal. You moved on to the next experience very quickly. Um, but people loved the trash portal. And uh, you know, you, you don't need every interaction in its digital form to be super complicated and super tech heavy um, and super interaction heavy. Um, you can have things that are, have the illusion of depth, the illusion that there is more depth there, that there could be more to it. And that can be really, really impactful. 
Um, so yeah, making sure that you have at least the illusion that there is more there can take you really far. So, you know, making simple things. Um, but but the, the biggest thing that I learned actually from, from directing the garage was placing your experiences. Um, and, and again, the biggest impact is probably not actually going to be where you think. So our big finale of the garage was the mech. You might have seen an earlier version of this experience at AWE once when it was called the navigator. Um, the, you know, we had a mechanic and she would take you over to this 10 foot mech and you would touch it and solenoids would like do, 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 because you, you'd have this like avatar moment where it chooses you. And we had this like really slick interface with glowing buttons and beep boop stuff and, and you got to travel the galaxy. And, um, and this is where we really invested on slick visuals and making sure the Magic Leap experience was super, super tight. It was the longest experience in the entire garage. Um, and you know what people did when they got up on the mech, like pretty much to a T, everyone took their headset off. Um, and like pretty much everyone. And, and we were like, what is going on? This is where we spent all our dev time. This is the coolest thing. Um, but I was like, okay, I, I can kind of understand, like, it's a pretty overwhelming experience, but you know, what then surprised me. Do you know where people spent all their time? If we just let them wander freely, this box, it was a box that was in the room because like the platform, it was already there. And when we got to the warehouse, we were like, eh, we don't really feel like figuring out how to unbolt this thing from the floor. So we'll just put some stuff in the box. So there's like, there's a space deer, there's a space deer in the box, whatever. People might look at it for a minute between the mech and the rocket car. Uh, and, but then people were obsessed. They were obsessed with the deer in the box. And I was like, what is going on here? We spent all this time on the mech and people are in love with the box from Home Depot. So here's what I think was going on. I talked about creating perceptual shifts earlier, right? Like, and what is perception? Perception is some combination of a stimuli and then my personal mental model for that stimuli. So if I see a cat, I have some, some mental models for how cats work, cat behavior. <clears throat> if the cat starts to fly, um, something in this Venn diagram has to shift. Um, I generally have expectations about what a box is going to do. I know how wooden boxes work. I've got a general idea of what they might contain. You know, like it's a box. Um, but <clears throat> with a mech, most humans walking around in the world don't have a mental model for what writing a mech is going to be like. Um, if you do, you know, I would like to know you, you sound like a very interesting person. Um, <clears throat> but we, you have to have an expectation already in order to subvert it. You can't just be giving people 100% new information. Whereas with the box, if a box has behaviors that don't fit my mental model of boxes, like that's really interesting. And my brain is saying, we need to pay attention to this because um, there's cats flying right now. Um, so, so now one of the principles that I'm trying to subscribe to is, you know, you don't necessarily want to put your most beautiful digital experience on your most beautiful physical experience. You might, there's sometimes reasons why you wanna do that, but question what, why it is that you wanna do that in the first place. Because I think when designing for, for mixed reality, you need contrast. You need both the mundane and the extraordinary. You need the expected and the unexpected. It's a pile of trash, but it's made of gold. It's a box, it contains entire worlds. It's a fridge. It's also a portal into alien worlds. Sometimes you don't need a 10 foot mech. Sometimes you just need a box from Home Depot. So um, yes, you wanna be careful about putting your most impactful digital experiences on your most impactful physical experiences when you can pursue contrast. Uh, so I spent like two, two and a half years at Meow Wolf. We did a lot of like cool, weird stuff. And then Snapchat approached me and they said, hey, we're launching this new headset. It's untethered. It works really, really well outside. And we would like you to be one of the artists whose work we launch with, um, which I was like, yes, that's awesome. 100% yes, I want to do that. 
And I knew, okay, I learned a lot at Meow Wolf about bridging that physical digital gap and more importantly, how to make those really interesting perceptual shifts. And now this was an added challenge where it's outside now. Um, I no longer have the super controlled environment of a Meow Wolf exhibit, but you know, I'm outdoors. So I spun on like a lot of ideas. Um, I wanted to make like a weather vane thing for a while. Um, but then my friend was like, hey, aren't you obsessed with those road signs? Um, and I was like, oh my God, like the road signs, the road signs, they're perfect. They're perfect for, for an XR experience. Um, so historic road markers, um, if, you've, if you're in the US, you've probably seen something like these, um, or if you've ever been like driven through the US, um, the, the New Mexico historic markers, they're, they're one of the older state programs, but lots and lots of states have them. And they came about with the idea of the Great American Road Trip, that towns were trying to get people to stop, trying to create a reason for you to drive through my town instead of their town. And, and I think they're, they're these sort of funny, archaic, wonderful things that give you a view into the past and how we used to try and and convey information in different ways. Um, you know, you obviously also, you have the text that's on the sign, that's a given, but you also have the weird placement of these signs. Um, so they actually tell you a lot about what the architecture of the state used to look like because um, when Route 66 was built, a lot of these towns died. So some of these signs are in ghost towns, but they, they also have a lot going for them from an XR perspective and, and from the perspective of some of the things I wanted to continue learning after the garage. So from the XR perspective, they are in these huge pullouts. Um, so you're really, you're supposed to stop at them. The, that's the whole idea, um, which, so it's not like a lot of other signage architecture that's out there in the world where you're supposed to be driving past it at 75 miles an hour. Like you don't probably want to build XR on top of that. That feels pretty unsafe. Um, but they're also, they're really, really big. They're high contrast. So it's relatively easy to do um, image tracking on them. The, the information on them is in the public domain and I love them. Um, so, so that was it and that was what I wanted to do. Um, and then from the perspective of continuing the learnings that I'd gotten from Meow Wolf, I was starting to get the, the inklings around, you know, I want to extend that feeling of the box and of the, the, the trash portal. Um, that here are these things that are part of the architecture of driving on an old state road you probably drive past them. You're not noticing them. They're not entering your brain. But if you could make these a portal into some kind of new magic, um, maybe people would start seeing them again. And, and if you can bring magic to an, an old highway sign on a pullout, like I, I thought that would be pretty cool. So I knew I wanted to work with these signs and uh, I saw three possible approaches for this project. The first was just, just expand the educational content. Um, how, how do you bring what that sign is trying to teach you into the world? How do you make it immersive? How do you make it really, really about that place? The other was this idea, and this is a, this is a zone of learning that I still really want to expand on, uh, but the idea that mixed reality can bring hidden layers. Um, you know, there's, so there's a lot of stories that they're not going to get government plaques. Um, there's also a lot of stories that have government plaques that like probably shouldn't like Onyate was this very famously cruel conquistador who committed like horrible violent crimes against the indigenous people here in New Mexico. He's got a historic marker. It's regularly defaced, but, um, you know, what would it look like to replace his marker with a story about, you know, why that bit of land is important to the Tewa people instead and have it told by them. Um, land has lots of stories that can be told in a lot of different ways. And we have the architecture, the physical architecture to do that. And we can build the digital architecture to tell those stories when it's really hard to change the physical architecture. Um, and, uh, New you know, New Mexico is weird and it, and it has really, really good stories and legends and people that just, they're not going to get the plaques. So finding other ways of showing the world. And, and then lastly, there was uh, this really cool thing that New Mexico did, which was they, they have a program for women's historic markers. So 
there's over 100 markers in New Mexico dedicated to all these amazing women, the first female black soldier, union organizers, like bandits and artists. And, and I wanted to approach the project as a curatorial one, pairing modern New Mexican women artists with historic figures and have them create work about those women that you'd be able to experience on site. So you could go on this like road trip, following women across the street uh, and, you know, like still do the cool New Mexico stuff and see White Sands and Carlsbad, but also have this like massive, uh, like multi-mile um, immersive storytelling experience with different generations of women on highway pullouts. Um, so instead of looking at the brief and being like, Snapchat asked you to make one experience, maybe like pick one of these things. I was like, no, nah, man, I'm going to do all three and it's going to be fine. Um, so March 2021 was a really fun month where I slept a lot and I felt really good about my choices. Um, hot tip, like it's always going to take longer than you think it will, especially when you are working with new hardware. That should be obvious. It's not obvious. Always remind yourself that when you get a new headset um, and you are estimating your timelines. Um, <clears throat> but I made some cool art. So the first thing that I built was the Caldera experience. So this was based on the, the Valle Grande historic marker, and it would let you see a topographical map of the Valle Caldera this 13 mile wide um, volcanic caldera that formed in an eruption like 1.25 million years ago. So you'd see this educational visualization, you'd hear a story, but then you'd look out over the caldera and um, you'd see the mountains labeled. So ideally you'd get a sense of scale of the eruption based on sort of this little diagram and then being able to see things. Um, and I learned a lot here. This this was the uh, the first outdoor experience that I built. Um, first thing that I learned was I needed a fake road sign to work with at home. Um, I needed to actually stand in front of a physical sign and walk around it and to have a physical facsimile of the thing. Um, so I, I made like in two minutes this big fake road sign for the studio at a phone court. If I could go back, I would make this super accurate to a historic marker. Like I would see if I could go buy an old one um, because things like the brown color or the different reflectivity of the material um, at different times of day, that would have been really, really good to have a better idea of when I was working. Um, but whatever you can do to have that facsimile of a physical object makes so much difference in terms of how you build experiences. So if you are doing something where there is a physical thing or a place that is going to be important to how you're interacting, like go to the place, make that thing out of foam core, do whatever you can to fake that while you're building, because it is going to change so much about how you are designing. Um, and then the other thing that I would change if I could go back, um, honestly, is I would approach this whole section of the project really differently. There's so, so much to learn here that I still want to explore. Um, but building an experience for this thing is very, very different from building an experience for this, for the very ground. Um, and all the thinking I had done was around the skill of a road sign and, and augmenting something that it's, it's not that beautiful. Like, I love them, um, but like, it's not this. And what did I learn at Meow Wolf? Like, don't necessarily put your stuff on top of the most beautiful stuff in the real world. Like, can't compete with a mech and like, can't compete with nature. And I don't, I don't actually want to compete with nature. Um, I, I question if I could go back, whether I would just cut this one and do the educational experience in one of the ghost towns on like a dirt highway. Just like maybe don't put your tech on top of this. But also I do think there's a world where XR could be good in a place like this um, and mixed reality. And, and like, regardless of like what I had ideas about putting tech in nature, this is what we're already doing. This is already how we're experiencing our nature. Um, our devices do go with us when we go into the natural world and like we can poo poo that, but like maybe we don't fight that and, and we say, okay, like this is the world and this is the world that people want because it's what they're doing. And so what do we do with that? Because um, if it's phones today, it's headsets tomorrow. 
And, and we have the chance right now to think about and to design this experience and to hopefully make it a little bit better and more connected than the one that we're all currently doing. Um, and I think ideally, you know, any XR experience would hopefully be like a, a meditation um, in nature, right? That it would ground you, it puts you in a good headspace, it makes you more aware of your space and your present. And you're looking at new new things with new eyes and maybe perceiving new things. Um, but yeah, those are some things that I, I want to explore for XR and nature in the future. And then I hope, you know, those of you who are here who are starting your journey in XR, that that might be a, a design issue that you want to tackle is like, if this is coming, like, how do we make that a positive experience? Um, and how do we do it better this time than we did with phones? Um, so that, that was the caldera. The next experience that I built was called Anita, and this was based around Anita Scott Coleman sign in Silver City. So Anita Scott Coleman was a black poet and essayist living and writing in New Mexico around the turn of the century. And she wrote a lot about the black experience of the Southwest at that time, which is like a really, really interesting history. You can look up the history of people like um, Buffalo soldiers and the black homesteaders, but um, her writing was considered unique in that it was associated with the Harlem Renaissance, even though she lived in Silver City, New Mexico, not Harlem. Um, and so for this, I collaborated with local Albuquerque poet, Ebony Isis Booth. Um, she did a performance of one of Anita Scott Coleman's poems called Portraiture. Um, the poem speaks about tall trees as a metaphor for the strength of Black men. So you have Ebony's beautiful performance that you're experiencing in this like immersive forest that fades in while you're viewing and this portrait of Anita herself. And, and I think this was the most successful piece on the project. Um, I think walking up to that sign and reading what is like, honestly, like really, really dry text in this weird piece of sidewalk um, in Silver City, but then having that totally transform and hearing this like beautiful performance play out around you and like seeing the forest, like 100% was the best part of the project. And, um, and uh, yeah, you can see sort of some animation of it. Um, another little process thing that really cemented itself here was quick and dirty photogrammetry doesn't have to be good um but that can do you wonders while you're building uh, now there's like a lot of pipelines coming up that are pretty much just like incorporating this into the process um but like you don't have to have the fancy new pipeline to get the benefits of this like you can just get out scanovers on your phone and pop something into Blender in order to be able to like block stuff out. And it will get you where you need to go in terms of your design so much quicker. Um, so yeah, that was, that was the New Mexico project. And that led into the next project that I ended up doing for Snapchat um, in collaboration with Hashtag Our Stories, which was another outdoor historical exploration, but this time in Boston. Um, and looking at um, location triggers as well. Um, and, and I knew, okay, we learned from the New Mexico project, um, like with the Valle Caldera, don't, don't put it on the, the beautiful thing. I'm making this in McDonald's parking lots, underground entrances, like alleyways. I, I'm gonna stay away from the beautiful gold domes and fall foliage of Boston. I, I only want to enhance things that you are not perceiving already. So there were two parts to this project. Um, the first part, I worked with photos from the Library of Congress and with local youth poet, Kevin Gu to create what they were very simple experiences where I just broke apart these historic photos and then you, you get to walk through them in the place that they were taken while listening to a poem that Kevin wrote in reaction both to the photos and to the modern historic site. And again, like this is not a super new idea. We've done overlays of historic photos in AR before, but, but um, I think this being in a headset and not on a phone and being outdoors and being something that you were physically walking through and seeing this woman at your eye level, it, that actually did feel pretty different when I tried it for the first time. Um, and I think there was something really delightful um, about the relationship between the person in the headset and whoever took the photos, right? So you're standing where they stood, you're seeing with your eyes 
something like what they saw and you're both using this new piece of technology that's in its early days. So for them, it was a camera um, and for you, it's a headset and knowing when you're using that thing that it's likely to change how we experience things in the future. The camera certainly changed everything and headsets probably will too. And, and I think it's a very similar experience we're having to be tinkering in the early days. Um, I also like to think the pigeons in, in the shot might be the ancestors of the pigeons um, that are uh, behind them, the real pigeons. Um, but yeah, I, th I think this got closer to that idea that I talked about earlier in the New Mexico series of, of hidden layers to a world. Um, and then the last piece in that series, which this was probably my favorite thing I ever worked on, was about a woman named Catherine Switzer. So Catherine was the first woman to register and run the Boston Marathon in 1967. And during her run, um, she was tackled by race officials who tried to physically rip the bib number from her, uh, from her body when they realized that a woman had registered and was running the race. Um, so she finished the race. She's alive. She's still running and being a total badass. And um, Yusuf Omar from Hashtag Our Stories interviewed her. And you get to hear her on site, uh, on the site that it happened, in her own words, tell you what it was like that day for her and to see the scene play out before you using historic photos from the press that day. And that one, that experience is like animated and much more complicated. This was an early version, but it shows you, this video shows you the best view of what that street looks like. Um, and it's a really nondescript street in Framingham. There's like a, uh, you know, an empty lot for sale next to it. Um, and, and I think it's, there's total magic to standing in a place that um, you might just walk through and seeing what happened and hearing her tell you this like amazing story all these decades later. And this is all over the world, but the potential for this sort of thing, for mixed reality to bring these sorts of experiences um, that teach us about the places that we are in or make them feel more magical, like that is there for mixed reality. Um, so that's all outdoors. And, and I, I spent a lot of time thinking about, about outdoors and, and mixed reality, but um, if you've seen any of my work, the, the most likely thing that you've seen is like one of the few things that I made indoors. Um, so I made this, this like, oh, why is it not playing? Yeah, I made this little baking demo. Um, you, you like see the recipe and, and um, having things labeled, being able to see sort of like where things would go and having physical measurements, having temperatures and timers that are local to the, and then I eat the cookie. It's a good cookie. Um, but yeah, so I made that. Um, and then it was accidentally the most popular thing I have ever built, um, which was a surprise. But um, uh, ba baking for me is is like a pretty special space. I bake like all the time and I spend a lot of time thinking about physicality and what it means to like be inside of a body um, and the relationship that that has to digital spaces and, and digital um, sort of manifestations in our physical world. And, and there's not many things that are more physical or corporeal than um, eating and food. That is very much about having a body. Um, but uh, which made it one of those spaces that I was actually a little bit nervous to wade into because like the Valle Caldera, cooking is already a very beautiful thing. Do you like, do I really wanna put my beep boop art on a beautiful thing? Um, do I wear my shirt? Am I really, really sure? Um, and, and I did, I decided that I did. And here's the biggest reason why we're, we're like really into presenting very dystopian visions of AR and food. Um, so we have the classic, uh, scary cucumber video game, um, scary fork, um, where your fork, the fork yells at this nice old man that he needs to eat more salad and not have, um, his breakfast um scary grocery store another classic and this is good i actually i love all of these i love kichi's work um and we need dystopias so that we can say like hey we don't want to live in that world that one seems like a bad one um we also 
And I think this is kind of harder. And what I hope to see out of students from XR Bootcamp and what I, I think I have seen from students from XR Bootcamp, honestly, um, is to be like, what, what about this world? It would be nice to live in this world. Maybe we could make something like this, like this would be a nice thing. Um, and, and, and I decided I was gonna do that. Um, I was gonna make the version that I thought was good um, or at least say like, maybe this one. Because there was a lot about food dystopian AR and MR that irked me because it, it felt like there's, there's a fundamental misunderstanding going on here of what is good about video games, what is good about making food, and what is good about mixed reality. And as somebody who cares a lot about all three of those things, um, you know, like I, I play video games a lot. And right now, at least, it's for escapism. Um, there's a lot of reasons to play, but like that's the big one for me right now. And baking is a lot more about like escaping into your real world that like maybe the world is falling apart. Um, but you know what, you can control those eggs and you can control that flour and you can make those cookies and show someone you love them by giving them the cookies. Um, and honestly, like I could give a whole talk just about food and augmented reality and mixed reality. Um, I, I gave a talk actually about food a couple weeks back. So if you're doing food things, hit me up. Um, I have thoughts. Um, but what, what I wanted to achieve here was to make sure I was not fundamentally altering the experience of baking. I'm, I'm not making a video game. The only, only thing that I am doing is removing points of friction. So things like I have to touch my phone and then I get batter on it, or I'm checking this timer, or I have to pull out a ruler to measure how far my dough should be. Um, so just remove friction so I can maintain flow and focus on what is already a really enjoyable thing here. And, uh, and you know what? I don't think I got it totally right. There was a lot of home cooks who were like, I'm kind of freaked out by this idea. I don't know why it makes me feel bad. And it is something that I'm still iterating on. Um, and I think it's so important to not just poo poo your naysayers and say like, well, you don't understand video games or you don't understand food or whatever it is. Uh, I think we're really, really bad about that in the XR space. And then also, this isn't a space I'm in, but also NFTs. I think we're really bad about being like, well, you just don't believe in the future. Um, well, if you think that, you know, they're not getting it right, like code talks, design talks, put your ideas out there, put them on the line about how you think this could actually be positive. And then also be ready to be humble and change it because your first idea is probably wrong. Um, so, you know, I, I think designing for something like this, for a space that we're not going to perceive, it's really, really different from designing for a space that's already really precious. Um, so this is a principle that I'm sort of grappling with currently. But the idea that if you're in a space or you're doing a thing or you're looking at a thing, that you're not engaging with, if it's a McDonald's parking lot, if it's a wooden box and you don't care about it, like how can I change that um, and invite you to be more present through the work that I make? Whereas if you're in a space or you're doing an activity or you are engaged with it and you do care about it, how do I step back as a designer? You know, how do I try to just remove friction from this experience that you're already having um, so you can be present. Um, and like, I've talked about presence a little bit over this, but like we, we spend a little under half of our time with our mind wandering and like imagined future worlds or ruminating on past worlds where we said something awkward on a date. Um, and there's really, really strong research that shows we're happiest when we're actually living in our present moment, when we're when we're in our body and we're in the space that we're in and we're paying attention to those things. So um, I think as a designer trying to understand, you know, who, where are you right now? Are you in a moment like that where you're, where you're present? Then I need to step back. Um, and if you're not, if you're spacing out at the bus stop, is there a way that I can shift the way that you are perceiving where you are in your world right now and give you a reason to pay attention and to be present and here in the space that you're in? Um, and I think this is like hard, this is really hard. 
Um, and I, like, I don't think I'm totally getting it right, but like, we have to make our awkward attempts at proposing good things because we are at the very beginning of this technology of its possibility of being in our daily lives and like being on our faces and changing the way that we look at our world. Um, so, you know, if like way out here is like dystopic hellscape and like way over here is utopia. And let's say like for the sake of argument that we think we're leaning just like a tiny bit towards dystopia right now, like not really big, big consequences in the future and a lot of ground to cover to even get back to neutral. Um, but like, if we scooch this up, like just a little bit, we didn't scooch it that far, just a tiny bit. Um, it makes such a difference on our trajectory in the future. Um, and there's a couple ways to do this. And I, I think the big way we're doing that in the public discourse currently is in reaction to the bad outcomes as we're showing dystopic worlds. And then we are reacting to those worlds and saying, no, 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 we don't want that. We also need people to be pointing at the ones that we do want. We need to be at least trying to propose the good outcomes. Um, because like, even as a, like a personal skeptic, sometimes I do think this technology is coming. Um, and what I can do as a technologist is I can propose ways for this technology to exist in our lives that feel positive. Um, and, and you need, you, you, you need to do that too. Um, and, and if people are saying, no, actually that feels bad and I don't mind that, like listen to what they're saying, and be ready to change. And, and not just people like your internal team, there needs to be more of this happening publicly, not behind closed campus doors. So we can actually find our blind spots and actually make good work. So while you're making things for all these different places for, for your dining room or for the mountain or for the McDonald's parking lot, whatever it is, I, I hope that as you participate in constructing our future, that you will take that thought with you of not just you know, how do I build a cool thing? But, you know, how do I do that well? How do I take that responsibility seriously considering the moment that we are in for this technology? Um, how do I give people new ways of perceiving their world? And how do I also respect the things and the spaces where maybe somebody doesn't want some new view and they don't want you to change it? Maybe the only thing I want is to be more present there, is to like not look at my phone and to pay attention to my pie or like my, my partner or my mountain or whatever it is. Um, and, and then as a designer, knowing the difference between what those spaces are, and that, that's hard, um, and being ready to be humble and to change in service of trying to get this right. Uh, because with mixed reality, the stakes are high. Again, this is our this is our literal faces, like our human meat eyeballs that we are going to be viewing the world with. Um, so, ideally, we'll all be turning trash into gold, but then also not accidentally turning to trash what is very golden about being a human already. And uh, that that is what I have for you. Um, so here is here's my information. Uh, Refract AR is available for work, and I, I really, really, really want to talk to you if you are doing things about food, if you are doing things about um, bodies or dance, um, or about large outdoor spaces or history. Um, so yeah, thanks for listening to me ramble for the past hour. Thanks, Lauren. It was really inspiring. I mean, you, you, you probably couldn't follow the chat, but yeah, the excitements and the inspirations you shared with us was amazing. I mean, at the end of the day, we are trying to create a seamless virtual and uh, real world in one platform, right? Uh, so it's not easy um, and you, you really inspired and opened the doors. Uh, without further ado, I would like to actually um, open up the discussion at least for our round table um, with our trainers and our um, graduates uh, and a few uh, our students as well so it's uh, a few more people so let me let me slowly um invite them to to the discussion in the meantime it's a very important thing that if you are asking a question please ask on the q a tab because it is very difficult for us to follow the 
um, chat window. That's uh, very important. So please share your question directly on the um, Q and A tab. I already um, tagged some of them, but let's first uh, take the first impressions or maybe comments of our uh, Hololens masterclass trainers as well, uh, and then uh, we will move to uh, Q and A part. So I think Fabian and Sean is uh, coming now. And I'm also adding our students who wants to join today. So let's, and we are already seeing a few questions uh, already. Yes, Sean is coming. Hello, Sean, can you hear us? Welcome. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Sean just uh, finished the mentorship session in the HoloLens masterclass. And yeah, uh, I hope that since uh, Sean is now, uh, I think we are entering to the Capstone Project Week. Uh, I hope that the inspirations that Lauren shared with us will be helpful for the Capstone Project. Um, Lauren, you are invited to the graduation ceremony. I think it will happen uh, on the second week of March. So uh, we we would love to see you as a jury and as a uh, like an expert there to give oh, feedback to, to our uh, our students. That sounds super cool. Yeah, I would love to. Perfect. Any anything that Sean you would like to add or anything that fits to our actual class and anything that uh, you want to oh. add on top of the no, no, that's absolutely fantastic. Uh, yeah, Lauren, our capstone project for the the boot camp class is actually inspired by your cooking demo that you did <laughs> and yeah. so actually all the students right yeah so all the students are actually doing that project they're all creating a mixed reality cooking baking experience and not quite as nice as baking cookies that would have been awesome but everyone's getting to make mixed reality spaghetti <laughs> Except yeah. you'll actually That's be able to eat spaghetti at the end of it, so which is nice. Oh, nice. <laughs> the one thing yeah. that one thing that we we want them to do is bringing a totally stranger to their kitchen, right? So mm -hmm. if they can survive and the taste of the spaghetti is good, then <laughs> they pass the class. Otherwise, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's a it's a problem. Exactly. So. We actually want exactly. them to navigate. Yeah, they're, they're not they're not rated on how good their app is. They're rated on how good their spaghetti tastes at the end yeah. of it, right? <laughs> like a master chef, right? I love that. <laughs> Great. So um, I'm also adding uh, some of our students. I think Fabian, I added him. I think he's also joining as well. So um, we can we can go through the questions, but I would like to first give the stage to uh, our students because they are having at least like 15 days to, to finish the project. And uh, I would like to ask if they have any uh, questions before uh, before we move to the uh, Q&A part. So um, Mark is also one of our uh, mentors as well. He is also very um, design centric. So uh, maybe he may also give some feedback. Joseph is also one of our graduates. Hey, Mark, how are you? Very well, thanks for inviting me. It was a great presentation. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you. Great, great to see you here as well. So um, yeah, uh, Joseph is actually uh, one of our uh, graduates from the foundations class. And we have also a few more people from the um, from the Holy Lands class that I, I'm one by one adding. It's not easy to go through these hundreds of people and then find our students. Uh, but yeah, uh, I will do one by one. But if, if you have uh, the chance to check, Laren, should we start from uh, a few of our questions already being submitted? I yeah, can yeah. go through that if you want, or you want yeah. to start from one of them, up to you. I can, yeah, I'll start at the top. Um, so I've worn HoloLens outdoors and I could barely see the holograms. Does Snapchat hardware really work well outdoors? Yeah, it does. Um, which like when they called me and they were like, it's an outdoor headset. And I was like, we'll see about that. I don't <laughs> believe you. Um, and, uh, but it totally, it does. And because what they are actually here, I have them. I'll just show you. Um, so, 
they're sunglasses, right? Like these are, these are quite opaque um, and they've, they've got a tint to them. So they work really well outside because of that tint. Um, if it is, if it is like a super duper bright day and it's the middle of the summer and there's no clouds, like I might have a little trouble, but I, honestly, I was surprised by how well they work. And I do think that the best experiences for the, for the spectacles are ones that are outdoors, which is pretty cool. It's very unique about the platform. I think you're muted, Fran. Uh, great. So uh, let's continue because we have a few more. Yep. Uh, um, what did you use to anchor the photos or objects onto the real world? So for the New Mexico series, I was using image tracking. So I was tracking the the uh, the signs themselves. And then for the Boston series, I was using a new thing called location tracking, which is on the SNAP platform where um, it's triggered based on latitude and longitude coordinates. And then for my future work on the spectacles, I'm looking at a thing called landmark tracking, which is, I think they're using a combination of like photogrammetry, the latitudinal and longitudinal information, um, and then like a couple other things coming together so that you can say like, okay, I know I'm looking at this specific location and it's gonna put it there. It's really cool. Um, but so it's been different modes of tracking per project. Um, and let's see, industrial use cases, how can XR improve the work? Um, and not overloaded with, I mean, that is like such a good question. Um, XR and industrial applications, like I think that has the highest possibility for use case. And I think it actually, like Google Glass currently does exist and it exists as something in industrial locations. There is um, one of Kichi who made hyper reality, he made another video, which I can't remember the name of, but which sort of addresses the, the dystopian reality that this could be. Um, and, and I think that's a good one to look at in terms of like, okay, like what are the, the problem spaces gonna be there and how do we do that well and not just try and turn people into machines. But um, really, yeah, it's a, it's a cool space. Um, do I consider working with dancers? Yeah, I really want to work with dancers. If you're a dancer and you wanna do something together, like one of my previous lives was as a swing dance teacher um which uh the pandemic sort of killed that but that's something i still like care a lot about so let's talk um what are the main elements needed to create immersive experiences that totally depends on the ex like what that means to you what does immersive experience mean um like baking is an immersive experience i'm immersed when i'm baking so is like wearing a vr headset um so it yeah, I would go back to you and say like, okay, what does it mean? What does it mean to be immersed to you? And then go from there. Um, and I, wanna, I wanna add something to that too. I, I think that's a really interesting question uh, because the idea of being immersed is kind of what happens in the mind, right? Sometimes you can read a, a book, right? A book has no moving pictures. It's very small but you can totally be sucked into the world of that book and, and your whole world around you disappears. Or even if you watch a, a movie on a little phone, right? Uh, even though that screen is so tiny, uh, you can be kind of sucked into that world of the movie where you kind of ignore what's going on around you and all you, your whole world is just that screen. And so I think that's uh, uh, where content really comes in, right? Is it's not that the technology makes your content immersive, but is your content itself able to kind of suck uh, the person in so that they really feel like they're in, in an immersive environment, if they feel like they're in the world that you're trying to put them into. And I think that uh, VR uh, devices and mixed reality, I think that definitely helps because, uh, you know, the visuals are all around you, you've got spatial audio, all that kind of stuff. But really it still comes back to the content, right? How, how is what you're making uh, uh, doing as far as its effectiveness and bringing the user into the world that you're trying to create for that user, whether it's a storytelling, like entertainment experience, or even if it's like a VR training, right? If, if you can make them feel like, okay, the device disappears, everything else disappears, but they're fully focused on the content and what you're trying to achieve, then I think that 
you've successfully achieved a, an immersive experience. Yeah, Perfect. Um, um, maybe, okay. maybe I can also introduce Fabian as well. He had some technical issues. Uh, Fabian is uh, from Mixed World uh, and uh, Island Labs. Uh, they are actually not maybe on the cooking side, but they are actually very, very expert on kitchen design, right? And he also worked at uh, Matrix Resurrections movie uh, for the volumetric capture. Hello, Fabian. It's nice to see you here as well. He's also part of the class as a trainer. So um, we would love to hear your comments, Fabian. I know that you couldn't talk. Maybe if anything you want to add, you're already writing the comments on the questions, but anything you want to add, please feel free to chime in. We, we cannot hear you. I think you are muted. No. <laughs> Thank you, Ferhan. Yeah, it was a really, really great uh, session, Lauren. Thank you so much for, for sharing all of this. Uh, also uh, very excited to learn about how, how you approach everything like this and how you come up with those really brilliant designs. Um, also really embracing mixed reality in a, as a whole in uh, all those uh, the sessions. That was really impressive for me to see throughout the session. And uh, as Ferhan already mentioned, the chat was really going wild on some of the things that you showed. So um, that, that's really cool. And of course, from the kitchen side, it was really fun to see um, that you did what we also had in mind when uh, designing this, <laughs> this class. That was really cool, brilliant. Yeah, great. So let's continue with the questions. We have a few more pending questions, I guess. Yeah, gosh, there were two in here that I really wanted to. Uh, ah, approaching XR experiences for longevity and not momentary gratification. I think this is such an interesting question right now. Um, and when that with my clients, they struggle with because clients will come to me and they'll say, well, we're going to design this. And then we want to design this in such a way that like 100 million people are going to be able to use it. And it's like, there's not 100 million of these headsets out there right now. Um, and like, there probably never will be because we're still figuring this all out. Like with all of this, everything is prototype hardware right now. And anybody who's telling you otherwise, like, I, you know, I have some snake oil to sell you too. Um, but like, it's still important work to do because we're figuring out how it's going to look when those are here. Um, but for me right now, more than longevity with the experiences that I'm looking for is for learning. I think we're still at the stage um, where like the, when movies first got made, it was revolutionary to figure out the cut that you could cut from one scene to another. We're still figuring those things out. Um, so I think that that for me is the more interesting question than making things that are going to last because we don't have our design paradigms yet. Um, but I do think that that is going to be an important question very soon, um, especially with all of the, the conversation around the metaverse and what that looks like and what it looks like to have um, consistent coherent spaces. Um, so that's it's not a question I'm looking at a lot myself currently, but it's an important one that like you should look at. Um, and then the user testing one. So I talked a little bit about like, I think that there's a big responsibility right now, especially from those of you who are listening who might be from big companies that have campuses where you're doing this sort of work to be doing a better job with our user testing. So for the Meow Wolf one, we were caught off guard by how people did it. And we did actually go through a lot of user testing, but we were prevented from bringing in people from outside the company. So the only people we user tested with were people who were from Meow Wolf, who were excited about the mech because of course they were, because it was the cool thing that we were all building together. Um, so we didn't get to have the insights for somebody who's not an experienced with Meow Wolf, not experienced with themed entertainment, not experienced with all of that. Um, so that it's really, really important to bring in people outside of your organization, outside of the things that you're doing, outside of your interests, your age groups, your everything, um, because like, you can't guess. Um, and if you do, like, you'll get it wrong. We got it wrong. Um, so that's that. Um, can, and then, yeah, I think, uh, how is AI, how important is AI in the mixed reality experience? Um, I mean, it's going to be super important. Um, that baking video, a lot of what I'm 
proposing is based on machine learning that is sort of there, but like it's not there yet, right? So one of the things that is in that video is where all of the ingredients are labeled, right? So ostensibly I could have done one of those. I could have done object recognition for one ingredient, but the world in which it's able to look at cross a table of ingredients and say like, this is flour and this is milk and this is this kind of milk and then label those accurately, like that's all machine learning, like and the being able to like locate where the thing is when it's a pot and the pot's not connected, like all of that is AI. Um, so the world in which this is an actually useful thing that's aware of our environments in real time and and can do things based on that where because like everything that I've built is like super, super niche and specific to to like this road sign or in my kitchen. Um, and we can extrapolate out to how that's going to be different. Um, but that's all based on AI and machine learning. Um, how have I incorporated accessibility for people with disabilities into my experiences? If so, how, and if not, why? Um, this is a thing that I have been like, I've, when I've worked with people who are making headsets, um, with early hardware, like one of my favorite things to work with them on is like, okay, like, how do you know that this user, um, like isn't using audio? Like if somebody constantly has their audio off and they haven't already input it, then like, do you want to ask them? Do you want to prompt them? Um, are there like lots and lots of different modalities through which you can experience stuff? And then also, um, oh man, lost my train of thought there. Um, that headsets, um, I think we get really caught on visuals from mixed reality, but there's a lot of other modalities through which we're going to experience things. There's audio, there's going to be, you know, probably some sort of haptic thing that we have. Um, like there's all of these other ways to input information. So making sure that you're giving people input in different ways. Um, and then also like some of my favorite projects that I've seen for mixed reality were about accessibility, like period. They, that was what they did. Um, there was this amazing project. I can't remember who built it, but um, it was, I think on the Magic Leap and um, this man has Parkinson's and he has this, uh, all of these little mats that he would throw down in front of him and it lets him walk better. Um, and because it's something to do with how you're perceiving information in your brain. If you have Parkinson's, it lets you walk in a straight line and the headset would just do that. It would just lay down lines. Um, and he was able to walk, um, which like, that was amazing. Um, there's, uh, and this isn't mixed reality, but you know, there's those haptic gloves that let people also who have tremors, um, hold, hold a spoon correctly. And I think there's a lot of potential there for mixed reality, not just to do a good job in terms of making sure that our experiences are accessible, but that it's a tool to, to make the world more accessible um and and like that's really really cool yeah i would like to add to to that specifically for for people with disabilities there, there has been a really interesting project uh, in germany um with uh, in cooperation with a german uh, football club they also have a museum and um when when hololens one was still a thing uh, they've been thinking about how can we incorporate uh, this technology to also enable um uh, people with uh, visual disabilities to use a mixed reality device that's specifically designed for creating uh, those those visual experiences. But what they figured out is that the HoloLens also has a really great um, um, audio array of microphones, which gives you the ability to hear spatially. And they've incorporated it together with the sensors, which allows the HoloLens to self-orient itself in a room to create a visual and uh, an audio guided tour so that um, um, uh, people with uh, visual disabilities could actually go through the tour, through the museum, utilizing a HoloLens where they actually removed the displays. So it was only the ring with the sensors and uh, the audio arrays. So you always have to kind of think out of the box, I think, and try to incorporate what you have uh, with this new technology. And sometimes you come up with some beautiful things like this. 
Yeah, I love that point. And also, too, I don't know what the school is in Germany, but there is like really fascinating stuff coming out of some particular school in Germany about accessibility and and XR in general. There was another project um, that um, it was for VR controllers, and it was assuming that you have limited mobility uh in in your arms so like if you're playing a first person shooter that you can't lift your arm up that far so like how do you um adjust based on like maybe i can only lift my hand up like a tiny bit um how do i still have the same experience i thought that was like a really really good and interesting and and like currently applicable um sort of area to be researching very interesting uh, do we have any questions left? Because maybe uh, we have five minutes left to, before finishing. I would like to ask everyone, especially our trainers here, what are the potential future challenges or current challenges that you see in a mixed reality and AR spatial environment? Uh, and do you have any, like maybe a suggestion or solution or answer to this? Uh, when you look at a little bit much more high level perspective, uh, Maybe can you share with us? I mean, Lauren, you already shared a few, but um, when you look at the like the growth of mixed reality in the next ten years, what are the biggest challenges waiting for? Not only the platform and hardware, uh, like tech giants, but also the creators and designers. Um. Gosh, I mean, the biggest one right now, I'd say it's like, it's all hardware stuff. It's like, how do we not hit thermal limits in 15 limits yeah. in 15 minutes? How do we not um, have headsets that are this heavy? How like all of those just sort of in and, and like, that's all still being solved. And I think that this is all sort of um we're all playing pretend until that is solved um but like I, like it's a good pretend game and it's one that we should play because i'm pretty sure we're going to solve the problems um and then after that it's like how how do we want this to inhabit our spaces right because this is it's our it's our faces it's our eyes and it's all the time right like you might use your phone in the bathroom because you pulled it out, but like if you're wearing glasses, like that's a whole other thing. And the, the potential for people to hack into that and the potential for people to be uncomfortable with that. I mean, I think the the backlash we initially had to Google Glass is it's we're gonna have a lot of stuff like that. And we're in a different world now where we're a lot more comfortable with cameras around us all the time um, than when Google Glass originally came out. But like those questions all still stand for like, do what, what happens when we all have, not only that, and then my old boss, Avi Barzeev wrote a great article called The Eye is the Prize um, about one of the reasons why we're probably all making this, why we're throwing billions of dollars into this industry is because we're gonna have great eye trackers where I have this thing on my face where I can not only tell like, okay, like you, you're, you pointed your camera at that, you know, uh, swimsuit, but I can tell you looked at the price tab for this long, your eyes dilated this much and I can fine tune my advertising like that much. So also like legislating that, deciding what is the world that we want to live in around that. And then also like helping the people who have to do that understand that that's coming. Yeah, data, more yeah. and never ending. <laughs> yeah. How about you, Sean? Any, anything that you would like that maybe you can also give some um, feedback from the students that we, when you are creating an MR experience or learning mixed reality, what are the challenges, biggest challenges that you have uh, observed and what is your advice? Yeah. Yeah, no, the, the students have been really diving deep into um, AI, integrating AI with mixed reality. That's been a huge focus of the course uh, and just leveraging the power of the cloud. Uh, so using stuff like spatial anchors, you know, cloud-based spatial anchors, using things like um, cloud-based, you know, speech recognition, translation, uh, image recognition, you know, and a whole host of of things. I think that's, yeah, it's really going to be interesting to see how as our devices get smaller, I think one strategy is to offload a lot of that to the cloud, right? So that you're not yeah. having a massive device that's, you know, taking up a, a massive, massive amount of, you know, computing on board, 
but offloading that to get to that smaller form factor, which kind of goes in line with what you were saying, Lauren, you know, kind of getting to that future where, you know, once we have all of this technology that we're wearing all the time, what does that look like for utopia versus dystopia, right? I really like that, you know, what the chart you showed, how it's like, it's actually, it's a very small, subtle difference now, but <laughs> it, it, you know, the path, the path uh, when you follow it down, there's almost like a point of no return, right? And we're kind of almost like, we're pretty much there right now, right? It's like, okay, small decisions we make today is going to have a huge impact on the future. And, you know, are we, are we going to be to blame if we end up in a dystopia, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I know, like, you know, just hearing even some of the interviews by people working early in some of the big social media companies, you know, they have regrets. They're like, oh man, like I created this thing, you know, that I, I regret making. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, so thinking about like, I don't want to be that guy, right? It's, I don't think any of us want to be, you know, somebody who regrets creating a dystopian future. So yeah, I really like that, you know, just seeing how like, okay, we've got AI, We've got these devices, they're shrinking in form factors. What can we do to enrich our lives and not isolate our lives anymore? Yeah. I think that's kind of you know one of my struggles with VR, you know, which is why I really love making social VR experiences where you can have people together in the same room. <laughs> yeah. Right. But yeah, just trying to think about like, you know, we don't want we don't want to be more isolated. We want to be more connected, but not in an isolating way, right? So yeah, just trying to think about about that. And I don't think it's I don't think it's something that we can all solve right now. But we should at least be thinking deeply about it. So yeah, I really appreciate you bringing that up during your talk, Lauren. I think that's super important, especially those of us uh, in this industry. All of us are pioneers in this industry. It's going to be the next big thing. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. I, I remember. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, if if there's anything to add, tell me because we 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 can maybe go through the Mark and uh, Fabian as well very quickly before finishing. If you want to add something, Clara. Oh, um, I I was going to respond to the you know we're we're sort of in the early days in in design responsibility, and I remember hearing this uh, anecdote about an early iPhone designer um, in the days of Tamagotchi um, oh. that this person had seen someone leaning up against a wall with their Tamagotchi and like looking at that and thinking like, that is such a weird thing to do. Like to, which is the thing that we all do now. Like if you see somebody like steering into their device, like leaned into a, like a alcove, um, that's not weird, but that they'd had that thought early, like while designing the iPhone um, that like, oh man, like, um, and then, and then that's the world. So yeah. Um, you know, for, for all of our best intentions, but we must have them, right? We must have our good intentions, so. Definitely designers will be the accountable or responsible of uh, whatever direction we are going. So we are, fingers crossed, let's say, and we will do our best yeah. to create ethical and responsible design uh, with the help of you masterminds, right? So um, how about you, Mark? Anything that comes to your mind in terms of challenges or any any advice so we can survive the next 10 years in the best <laughs> way possible? Well, I feel like most things in life move in a wave. And so luckily it may not be like Lauren's chart, but I think it's a good wake up call for us to pay attention. And luckily those headsets are not glued to my face. So, you know, users can choose to disconnect those things, take them out, as long as they're not embedded in your body or something. Um, <laughs> I don't think I'd go that far, right? Uh, so, yeah, lots of great points um, brought up about what we can do and the things we need to consider. Um, I was thinking one reason I was blown away by Lauren's cooking experience was, one, just the pure practicality of it is amazing. Um, if I could read temperatures on things I can't even touch and stuff like that, that's super cool. And maybe when, you know, infrared is integrated, uh, we'll be able to do that. But it also occurred to me as a baker, I love to bake as well. Um, a lot of the things that you learn to do is by touch. And, and one thing those headsets are not, is not going to do for me is touch my dough. Um, but what it could do is suggest to me that I'm waiting for a certain kind of feel or pop up a little you know, 2D uh, image overlay that says, 
well, your dough shouldn't be cracking like this. It should be springy and bounce back when you poke it kind of thing. I don't need any more help from it, which would then allow me to stay immersed in that experience, right? So I think there's a balancing act to, to happen here, the practical, the pure practical component of it. And then the, um, like Lauren said, allow me to, to remain immersed in that experience. Otherwise tech gets in the way, right? And that's that's something that reminds me that Tech isn't going to save us. It's an interactive thing. What we need to decide as designers and users is where are those lines in the sand, where it's giving me an advantage and it's helping me make a great loaf of bread, but it's not its not Gordon Ramsay, as the chat said, getting in my way or making me feel bad about it, right? Um, or complicating the experience so it takes me out of it. It's like suspension of disbelief for a movie, right? You don't wanna have reality come crashing in when you're watching. So yeah, it's gonna be a very interesting space to watch evolve. And again, Lauren, thank you so much. Perfect. Uh, how about you, Fabian? I also would like to uh, a little bit take a glimpse of your um, eye-opening uh, use cases that you are always sharing with us on the class. Maybe you can share one of them. The, the mirror one is my favorite, but I don't know, you decide. Uh, yeah. So we can wrap it up afterwards. Yeah, so um, first of all, in terms of challenges, I think one of the challenges, except from uh, what everyone has said in regards to the technology, uh, would be to also help uh, the general audience to get a good feeling about the technology without them getting afraid. So putting meaning and uh, a real purpose to those experiences, I think one of the biggest challenges um, um, just as an example, at, at Island Labs, when we started out creating our um, software for selling kitchens to people, we not only had to convince uh, the sales experts who would use this on a day-to-day -day basis, but also, of course, we were in touch with people who never used the technology before. And at first, when we tried it out in the laboratory, before we even went to the streets, we always had some feedback regarding uh, the very narrow um, field of view of the HoloLens and how it doesn't display the colors correctly and all that. Um, but when we showed it to the actual audience, when we saw it for the first time in action, um, giving the people who really want to solve a problem they have, they want to buy a new kitchen, and then suddenly having a technology that enables them to make a, a very good decision on spacing inside of the room and how everything fits together. No one complained about the small size uh, of the display. They were just blown away by the possibility that it opened up for them because the software was designed in terms of giving them uh, a voice and a, a, a way to communicate with the sales experts what their actual needs are. And I think this is really, uh, really powerful. Um, and that's that's why I, I love this kind of story uh, to tell us uh, every day. So do not be afraid of of thinking from this user's perspective and then reiterate on, on whatever you do. And don't be afraid to throw away stuff because that's happening in the process. Just do it. <laughs> and then um, everything else will come come along, I think. Definitely, definitely. Uh, thank you, Fabian. I mean, uh, we are always trying to give the notion of iterating, failing fast, you know, because this is how we grow, how we learn, how we improve. So uh, thanks everyone for joining today. Uh, we are a little bit uh, uh, ahead of the schedule, but I hope that everyone enjoyed here. They are still staying. So it means that they are still enjoying at least. So thanks again, Laron. First of all, thanks for joining us. And um, we will continue doing this uh, kind of round table and uh, this kind of like design breakdown sessions for different use cases. So if you are interested, please share on our Discord server what kind of uh, topics or use cases that you would like to see. Uh, we would love to really uh, continue this discussion because it's very powerful for inspirational for our audience and XR community. So thanks for joining Laron and our team, Fabian, Sean, Mark, Joseph, and so let's keep in touch on Discord and yeah, see you in the next open lecture. Thank you. And Sean and Mark and Fabian, I love all of your work. So it was really cool to get to meet and talk to you. Um, thank you. And thank you, you too. Everyone. Yeah. Um, thank and th you. thanks to everybody who's still here um, for attending. Thank you, everyone.
拜拜。Bye bye.